Hello, just before we get started, just a public service announcement from British Scandal HQ. I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, British politics is a bin fire at the moment. And I'll be honest, we can't keep up with the minute by minute earthquakes happening in government. So please forgive us if we sound like we recorded this before Liz Truss got the boot, because we kind of did. Just a warning before we begin this episode, it does contain strong language, Alice. I might not have heard some of these words before. I think I've heard you use all of them. <laughs> Hi, Alice. Hi, yeah, just give me one sec. Okay. He's callous, uh, he's arrogant, prone to lying and deception. Doesn't know the difference between right and wrong. Oh, were you doing your prep for the Boris Johnson episode? Uh... Sure. Yeah, let's say that. Is this about me? Also paranoid. It's August 2010. Lazy Lagoon Island, Tanzania. Boris walks out of his luxury holiday lodge, lowers himself into the warm turquoise sea. He floats on his back, watches his wife Marina, as she sits on a sun lounger and picks up a book. He's paying £700 a night for this, and they've hardly spoken since they got here. He's desperate to patch things up with her. He's been London Mayor for two years, and he'd promised he wouldn't have an affair while he was at City Hall. Was that in the vows? (laughs) That was one of his five pledges to the public. (laughs) But he'd met an art consultant called Helen McIntyre. He'd hired her as an unpaid advisor. Last year, she had his baby. Something must have happened between those two things. The officials at City Hall had given him a hard time about it. Worst of all, Marina had been distraught. He swims a little way further out, tries to clear his head. But his legs are already tired. He's 46 years old and nowhere near as fit as he wants to be. And nowhere near as successful either. Being mayor gives him some power, but he'd hoped he'd be well on his way to being prime minister now. Turns, starts to head back to the lodge. But the current is strong. He's being dragged out, away from the shore. Marina? A wave goes over his head. He gulps for air. Help! Somebody help! A few seconds later, another wave hits and drags him under. His eyes sting. He watches the bubbles slowly escape from his mouth. He tries to power himself to the surface, but the current drags him back down. His heart thuds. He struggles, clawing at the water, feeling himself being pushed down further. He tries to scream, but a wave of water hits him in the face. He feels like he's choking. He thinks to himself, I'm going to die. I'm going to die before I've done the things I want to do, before I've tasted real power. He stops struggling gives into the current and the pull of the waves. Then from nowhere, he feels something behind him, feels his body being lifted up. He gasps when he hits the surface. Four hands reach out. He grabs one, hauls himself onto a boat. He gulps in air, looks at the worried faces of the hotel workers who've rescued him. Hears himself gasp. Oh, that was bloody close. 20 minutes later, he eases himself onto the sun lounger as Marina wraps him in a towel. Marina's face is grey with fear. What the hell happened? He lets her fuss over him. Then he draws her to him and kisses her. I love you. He lies back, closes his eyes and listens to the water gently roll onto the sand. He survived. He's got another chance. He's going to put his marriage right, work hard, focus, and do whatever it takes to become Prime Minister. From Wondery, I'm Matt Ford. And I'm Alice Levine. And this is British Scandal. So, 
Alice, when we do these series, sometimes you find yourself rooting for protagonists that you would never previously thought you'd have any sympathy for. So on any level, are you warming to Boris Johnson? It's tough, isn't it? Because we try and be empathetic. You've got to look at him, especially in the beginning of the last episode. He is just a young boy. And although he's surrounded by privilege, he does have this monstrous father who's parading his affairs around his kids. In fact, Boris is the one that has to break it to his mum. Boris is also kind of neglected in a way, even though he's got material wealth and support. His brother shoots him on his dad's watch. He's dumped at boarding school, which we know often does not end well. But then on the other hand, we see the beginnings of this raging ego and this sense of entitlement, his distant relationship with the truth. And of course, his lack of morality when he decides, kind of unflinchingly, to help his friend beat up a journalist. Because what you're saying is... He's your kind of guy. (laughs) A little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. Well, in this episode, I think there's going to be a little less of column A and a lot of column B. This is episode two, Mare on a Zip Wire. Twelve years earlier, the 20th of October 2004, Liverpool. Boris squirms in his chair. He's wearing a smart grey suit and blue tie, and he's combed his hair flat. He's been Shadow Arts Minister for a few months now. But he's not in Liverpool to talk about the arts. He's here to make an apology. A few days ago, The Spectator published an article accusing Liverpool of wallowing in victim status after the kidnap and murder of Ken Bigley, a civil engineer who was working in Iraq. There's a chance that people will remember the noise and furore around this, even if they don't remember the details. Yes, Ken Bigley was beheaded, and it was a murder that, didn't just shock the country, it shocked the world. So to publish an article that contained a phrase like that was just completely disrespectful and outrageous. And considering the context of Liverpool, not a city or people who at this point really have any trust in the media anyway, thanks to the coverage of Hillsborough, this would have been such an electrified situation. Tory leader Michael Howard had called him into his office furious. He hadn't written the article himself, But Howard told him that as the editor, he needed to take the rap. The election's a year away. We need seats in the North West. Get up there and apologise. He'd driven up straight away with four large bodyguards. He stares at the BBC Radio Merseyside reporter now, focuses all his attention on getting his tone right. What are you going to say to the Bigley family, Mr Johnson? Are you going to resign from the spectator? His eyes widen. The spectator makes him powerful in the party. It's his link with the grassroots. He can't afford to lose that or the income. He leans into the microphone. I bitterly regret uh, this article and I'm deeply sorry for any offence it caused. I love Liverpool and the people of Liverpool and I hope that they can forgive me. The radio journalist glares at him. Let's hear from some callers. He swallows hard as he listens to Ken Bigley's brother, Paul, tell him... You're a self-centred, pompous twit. Get out of public life. He stutters his way through an apology, but everyone in the studio glares at him. Outside in the cold grey drizzle, he puts his head down as a dozen journalists yell questions. Back in the car, he swallows a couple of aspirin as his driver dodges angry crowds and heads back to London. That night, he's with Petronella Wyatt. She's a journalist at The Spectator, and they've been having an affair for a few years now. I knew I should have been keeping a tally. He runs his fingers through her long, tousled hair and tells her how difficult Operation Scouse Grovel was. They came at me from all sides, called me a Tory buffoon. I was like a squeezed lemon. A few days later, he's heading home with Marina. He's about to open the front door when a journalist jumps up with a camera. Is it true you're having an affair with Petronella Wyatt, Mr Johnson? He swallows hard, looks at Marina's drained face. Her eyes fill with tears. He turns back to the reporter and clears his throat. throat) Absolutely not. Marina pushes past him and runs inside. He follows, tells her it's all rubbish. We had a couple of drinks, that's all. He snatches up the phone. His shoulders slump. It's Michael Howard, and he's furious. Boris takes a breath. 
He's under siege from the press and his party, but he's going to fight back. He's going to hold on to his position, no matter what it takes. A few weeks later, Michael Howard's office, House of Commons. Michael Howard shoves away the pile of newspapers, covers his face with his hands. He needs to decide what he's going to do about Boris. He spent the last hour reading lurid details about his junior shadow minister's affair with Petronella Wyatt. Boris cheats with blonde. Boris told me he was busting with spunk, says close friend. S- what? Couple drive around St John's Wood, snogging in back seat while driver plays tape of Petronella singing Puccini. Boris doesn't tip much, complains Cabby. That is phenomenal. Michael Howard picks up his phone. Send him in. He looks at Johnson. His suit is crumpled like he's slept in it. He's got an expression like a beaten dog. Sit down. As soon as Johnson sits, he throws a newspaper at him. Watches Johnson's bloodshot, hooded eyes skim over the article. It's all lies, an inverted pyramid of piffle. Petronella and I are good friends, that's all. These hacks are out to get me. Howard leans back, takes off his glasses and polishes them slowly. Boris Johnson has been a nightmare to deal with since day one. The trouble is, there's no one else like him in the party. He's popular and draws in new members. He even makes it onto magazine cool lists alongside the likes of George Clooney. It's so hard to imagine. I mean, the the idea that any leading politician would be in those pages alongside Hollywood stars is just so surreal. Especially in retrospect, given how the country feels about him now, given his behaviour inside number 10, to think that he was ever a kind of... A pin-up. Exactly. Howard hates his MPs lying to the press. Most of all, he hates his MPs lying to him. He puts his glasses back on. I want you to resign your position in the shadow cabinet. Johnson's eyes flash a look of astonishment. Howard folds his hands on his desk. There's no other way. The situation cannot be salvaged. He watches him hang his head. Hears him say, No. Howard frowns. Did he just hear that right? This isn't a debate. He catches a steely glint in Johnson's eyes. It's my private life. I have a right to lie about it. I won't resign. This is astonishing. Howard stares as Johnson leans forward. Sack me at your peril. Go on. Howard feels his jaw slacken. For a second, he's lost for words. Then he pulls himself up to his full height. OK, you're sacked. Get out. Boris gives him a shocked look. When he's gone, Howard puts his head in his hands. He feels drained. He's just won a minor victory, but it doesn't feel like it. He's got rid of the most charismatic person in the party. The only person who can win voters from across the political spectrum. And he already regrets losing him. The 6th of December 2005, Westminster, London. Boris strides along the riverfront near the House of Commons takes in the damp winter air, then heads inside. The central lobby is buzzing with MPs and reporters. Someone shoves a microphone at him and asks what he thinks of David Cameron's election as the new party leader. He pastes on a grid. I'm delighted. I'm sure he'll be a fantastic leader, just what the country needs. As soon as the reporter's gone, so has his smile. The truth is, he's gutted Cameron has leapfrogged him as leader. Cameron Minor was two years behind him at Oxford, and he's nowhere near as brilliant as he is. What does Cameron Minor mean? So this was a public school nickname. If you had an older brother, they would be Cameron Major, and the younger one would be Cameron Minor, which is fair enough. But even this late into adulthood, Boris Johnson is still stuck in that public schoolboy mindset. Since Howard sacked him last year, he's been kicking his heels on the back benches. His only hope now is that Cameron will give him a shadow cabinet post. The wait has been agony and humiliating. 
he's had to drop Cameron's serious hints. A few weeks ago, he'd gone on Desert Island Discs. He told Sue Lawley, It would be pretty bogs of me to outline a job request. Uh, OK, I'll tell you. Trade. World trade. Then he asked for a large pot of French mustard as his luxury. Should I be reading into that? Well, I guess he's trying to make a point about world trade, but surely this is an unpatriotic choice. As a Brexiteer, surely he should favour English mustard. I mean, you can't be Dijon. With a roast? Oh, now you got me. Stop talking Britain down. In his office, he puts his feet on the desk, makes a catapult with elastic bands and pings bits of paper at the wall. He snatches up the phone. On the other end is one of David Cameron's aides. The leader of the opposition would like to offer you the post of Shadow Higher Education Minister. Boris slumps. It's not even a Shadow Cabinet post. But he has no choice. He's about to say he'll take it when he hears the aide say, On condition you give up your editorship of The Spectator. Mr Cameron doesn't want a repeat of the Liverpool fiasco. Boris rubs his forehead, lets out a sigh. Let me think it over. That night, he lies in the darkness and stares at the ceiling. Marina rolls away from him. Things have been tense since his affair with Petronella, but he hears her say, Cameron's lucky to have you. Who else is as popular with the grassroots? He kisses the back of her neck, then heads downstairs to the kitchen, eats some leftover pizza. Next day, he rings Cameron and accepts his offer, then resigns from the spectator. He's on his way to his new office when he bumps into Michael Gove. I'm on my way to see Dave. He just made me Shadow Minister for Housing and Planning. I'll be your boss soon, Boris. Watch out. God, it's a smarm off, isn't it? Gove smirks, then walks away. Boris stands in silence for a few seconds, stunned. The idea of Michael Gove overtaking him is too humiliating. So he vows, somehow, he's going to get his revenge and beat them both. November 2006, North Kensington, London. David Cameron takes out the roast chicken from the oven and carries it carefully to the dining table. He's invited the editor of the Evening Standard, Veronica Wadley, to lunch. He's determined to impress her with his culinary skills and get her advice on who to put forward as Conservative candidate for Mayor of London. So you've got no clear candidate? He shakes his head, carves the chicken and dishes it out. Whoever I choose will be a lamb to the slaughter against Ken Livingstone. He watches Veronica nod. Right now, Livingstone's at the height of his popularity. He's a socialist on his second term as mayor, and last year he secured London's bid to host the 2012 Olympics. Cameron hears himself mutter, He's a brilliant politician and people love him, especially on the left. He watches Veronica dab her mouth with her napkin. What about Boris? He laughs, but she glares at him. Don't count him out. He's optimistic. He makes people feel good. He's the only Tory with enough charm to win over Londoners. David tops up their glasses. He's also bloody useless. And those Spectator articles, he's attacked Jamaican men, Muslim women, single parents, not to mention the whole population of Liverpool. And don't get me started on his affairs. I had to put someone on his door at the party conference to stop him sneaking women in. He watches her tuck a strand of dark hair behind her ears. He also sells papers. If you do choose him, we'll back him at the standard. When Veronica's gone, he pours himself a glass of wine thinks back to the party conference in Bournemouth in October. It had been his first conference since becoming party leader and he'd given the speech of his life, defending the NHS and saying the party was ready to serve the nation again. He'd poured over every word and crafted it carefully. But it was Boris who'd brought everyone to their feet with a silly speech defending mothers' rights to feed their kids junk food. I say let people eat what they like. Why shouldn't mothers push pies through railings? So this was the Jamie Oliver thing? Yes, he'd done a show where he'd got school kids to eat healthy food, but some of the parents objected, went down to the school gates with junk food and passed that to their children through the school railings. I remember that image. And what's interesting about that, I guess, is not only was it quite funny, 
But for a politician to weaponise that showed his knack for populist issues outside of the traditional briefs of, say, education or the economy, interest rates or inflation. He's focusing from a very early stage on effectively almost political gossip issues that get people talking. And he had an instinct for that stuff and maybe a shamelessness about it that people like David Cameron perhaps didn't. Cameron had been livid, not just because Boris had gone off message about public health, but because his speech was all anyone talked about. He takes a sip of wine and leans back. Keeping Boris busy running for mayor might not be a bad idea. He could certainly do without him lurking around at Westminster, making his life difficult. Who knows? If Veronica's right, he might even win. But first, he needs to persuade Boris to go for it. Two thousand and seven, City Hall, London. Linton Crosby marches through the corridors of City Hall. He's tired, jet lagged, and furious. Boris Johnson's gone missing, and he needs to find him. He pushes open doors. Boris, where the fuck are you? He smooths down his fringe, looks up and down the corridor, then kicks the door in fury. He's got a solid reputation back home in Australia as an election guru. The press call him the Wizard of Oz. Crosby already regrets taking this job. This guy Boris is hopeless. He doesn't turn up for meetings. And when he does, he looks like he's just come back from an all-nighter. And he's behind in the polls. Cameron told him Boris is a star. But as far as Crosby can make out, all he's capable of is cracking jokes. Whoa, 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 let's not condemn what is a genuinely rare and accomplished skill. Yeah, I mean, it's a craft. It's an art. Yes, I think in many ways, it's wrong for us to call ourselves geniuses, but surely other people must, given our output. Some of that low-hanging fruit is heavy. <laughs> Crosby opens the door to a cupboard, switches on the light, looks at a load of Star Wars props. He opens a coffin lid, and sees Boris. Sorry, what are you talking about? He jumps back, shocked. What the fuck are you playing at? He hears Boris mumble something about having a nap. He drags him out of the coffin, marches him to the meeting, shoves him in a chair and demands to know what his policies are, listens as Boris mutters something about getting rid of bendy buses and building a cable car. Listen to those mumbles, because that is the extent of the plan. Crosby's hand flies up to his thick hair, this guy's a lazy, bumbling fool. Crosby storms out of the building, heads along the river, tries to walk off his frustration. Half an hour later, he walks back to City Hall. Boris is outside, surrounded by a group of passers-by. Crosby watches for a few moments. What strikes him isn't the number of people who surround Boris, it's who they are. He watches smiling teenage girls ask for selfies, Men with tattoos yelling their support. Rich women with little yapping dogs waving. In the meeting, he sits back and watches as Boris cracks jokes and makes the room laugh. A few hours ago, he was irritated. Boris had no clear political direction or agenda. But now he wonders if that matters. If the group outside were anything to go by, this guy's a potential voter magnet. He's not a normal politician. He's Boris, a personality. All Crosby needs to do is smooth off his rough edges and widen his appeal. Ken Livingstone won't be a pushover. He's ahead in the polls and highly experienced. And he's as tough as they come. But Boris, with his personality, might just make it. It's so baffling to me that his personality is being categorised as a positive. I mean, that, that still now, the alchemy of his appeal is just incomprehensible to me. Yes, because people like charismatic politicians, you think of Bill Clinton and Tony Blair, but they were also underpinned by a very clear policy agenda and political philosophy. One of the things that people say about Boris Johnson is not only was his personality his strength, but actually he didn't really stand for anything. And again, that's the sort of thing that would have ended any other politician, but for him he managed to make it work. 
And so many contradictions. You know, people liked him because he wasn't a politician as they saw it. But yet he's so clearly establishment. Yeah. He went to Eton, Oxbridge, had been mayor of London and a member of parliament. He says, convey a belt as you get in that regard. But what he understood was that there was a mood and a desire for politicians to be a bit rough around the edges. A bit more undone. Undone, provocative, arguably disrespectful and funny. When the meeting's over, Crosby sits him down. Here's the deal. You get a haircut, stick to the script and no more affairs. He watches as Boris's eyes narrow. So you think I can win then? Crosby smiles. You've got a breakfast meeting with hedge funders and other donors tomorrow. Don't be late. He watches Boris promise. Then he leans in, close. And Boris, if you let me down, I'll cut your fucking knees off. March 2008. Quirinali Restaurant, London. Boris takes a mouthful of carpaccio, glances round at the tranquil basement room with its huge skylight. He's in the final days of campaigning and his last debate against Ken Livingstone had been a disaster. Livingstone had contradicted him on almost everything he said, including on ancient Greece. He's down in the polls and now voting's just weeks away. He looks over at Linton Crosby. I'm doomed if I carry on like this. You're the strategy genius. Do something. He watches Crosby push a file towards him. Andrew Gilligan of The Standard's been digging around. Ken's senior policy advisor, Lee Jasper, is having an affair. And his girlfriend's businesses got a hundred grand for community projects on his recommendation. Boris wipes away the wine stain from his tie and opens up the file. He glances up at Crosby. You seriously want me to condemn another man for having an affair? I'm glad he identified the hypocrisy there. (laughs) He watches Crosby's hand reach out to take the file back. But he stops him. I I didn't say I wouldn't. Just make sure you get me plenty of intel. There we go. I did think that was a bit of a strange wobble for him. A few days later, Boris stands under TV studio lights and faces Ken Livingstone. He waves a copy of the Evening Standard and launches into his attack. Under Red Ken's watch, City Hall has turned into a den of iniquity. One big slush fund for Ken's cronies. In fact, he should be called Ken Leaving Soon. That's how much his reputation has been damaged. Look, I'm no fan of a pun, but that's good. He listens as the studio audience erupts in laughter. Then goes on to promise that if he's elected, he'll make City Hall open, accountable and completely sleaze-free. A few days later, at 11.54pm, he stands with Marina and his four kids. Why only the four? I think they're the only ones he could fit in the car. Oh, sure. He listens in the hushed silence as the mayoral results are declared. Kenneth Robert Livingston, 893,877 votes. Alexander Boris de Fafel Johnson, 1,043,761 votes. <laughs> Boris hugs Marina, stands on the stage, announces plans for a £2 million firework display on New Year's Eve and a 200-foot image of himself to be projected on a building by the river. Crosby whisks him away, hands him his mobile. Cameron wants a word. He puts it to his ear, listens as David Cameron congratulates him. (laughs) You had us worried there for a while. He laughs, hands the phone back to Crosby. The truth is, he doesn't need David Cameron's congratulations. He's got his own power base now. He's got a £12 million budget and he's in charge of the capital. From now on, he's going to distance himself from Parliament. He's going to work hard to become an even bigger political force than the party itself. And then he's going to take it over. Four years later, August the 1st, 2012, Victoria Park, London. Boris stands on a platform as a man in a high-vis jacket checks the clip under his chin, securing the helmet in place. Oh, 
I know where this is going. I hoped we'd get here. How bloody long is this thing going to take? Once you get going, you should be over the other side in a minute. When they suggested he zip wire across the park to promote the Olympics, he was delighted at the idea. But now, crammed into a harness and looking out over the crowd, he wishes he was anywhere but here. I can't believe there was a moment where he was pro this idea. Okay. A walkie-talkie crackles to life, instructing him to jump. He looks down. He can't tell how far it is if the wire snaps, but it's a long way to fall. He looks at the expectant faces in the crowd. There's nothing for it. He jumps, feels the sense of elation as he starts travelling down the wire. But then he starts slowing down, and as he slows, the wire swings him so he's facing backwards. He starts frantically looking over his shoulder, trying to twist his body round, but the line won't budge. He tries to hide his panic, willing his weight to push him further, but he's stuck. He looks down again. Now the crowd is laughing. He's 17 stone, and the harness is digging into his crotch. I feel like there are lots of moments in British Scandal which feel like classic anxiety dreams. <laughs> and this is one of them. This is like completely nightmarish. Obviously, that harness is cutting off blood to a crucial part of the body. That Had that harness succeeded in fully injuring him there, <laughs> the next few years could have gone very differently for our country. He tries to hide his nether region with one of the plastic Union Jacks he's holding, waves the other aimlessly and yells down, Oh, this is great fun, but it needs to go faster. Can someone send a ladder? He shouts down at Carl, his bodyguard. Seriously, do something! He watches Carl take out his phone and take a photo. He sighs, gazes off into the distance. He's been working hard to make sure the Olympics are a success. He's cleared London streets of homeless people. If by that you mean he has driven them out of London to other cities, sure. He sent teams of people out to paint and clean and plant flower beds. He's got the Olympic Park completed on time and to budget. He'd welcomed the Olympic flame to London. As, as Henry VIII discovered with at least two of his wives, this is a perfect place to bring an old flame. Come on, there are touring comedians with worse lines. The opening ceremony was flawless, watched by a billion people around the world. And now Britain has just won its first gold medal. But he's stuck in this harness while everyone films him. It's embarrassing. He's got another reason for wanting to get down. A few months ago, he met a Californian digital entrepreneur called Jennifer Acuri. She's blonde, sexy and funny. And he's got her private number. He'd promised Linton Crosby he wouldn't sleep with her until after the mayoral election. The bizarre nature of these agreements... I love on that. I'll only cheat my wife after polling day. You have my word. But now he's been re-elected, he and Jennifer have been flirting a lot. He likes to recite Shakespeare's sonnets to her. He's helped Jennifer out by speaking at one of her events at the Holt Business School. He's going to keep this affair top secret. Marina would never forgive him. Neither would the Jobsworths at City Hall. I think that Boris thinks of it a bit like a loyalty card for a coffee shop. He gets a free one after he's apologised, you know, like 10 times for 10 affairs. He just gets one that he's supposed to be let off from. He shuffles again in the harness. His toes feel numb. He hears the wind whistle past his blue safety helmet. He looks down at the crowd. Some have started drifting off. He waves his flag again and grins. But he's exhausted. Eventually, the engineers get him down. He's applauded by the small crowd. He grins at the remaining cameras. I had the best view of the world up there. In the car on the way home, he tells Carl, his bodyguard, the whole thing was a disaster. I look like wet washing dangling on that bloody line. But Carl tells him he's trending on Twitter. He hands him his phone. Boris scrolls down the feed. Reads how he's a great sport, how he doesn't take himself seriously. That he's a true man of the people, not like the stuffy elites in Parliament. He lets his head rest back and grins. Boris Mania is sweeping the nation. Oh, give me a break. 
A few days later, he sits next to David Cameron in the Olympic Stadium and watches the games. The cameras have just picked them out and Cameron's face fills the screen. Then the camera turns to Boris. The whole stadium erupts with cheers and chants of Boris, Boris, Boris. What a response, not just the recognition, but the adulation. Yes, and it gets a totally different response to the Chancellor, George Osborne, who a few weeks later at the Paralympics that London hosts as well, is booed in the stadium as a result of austerity and cuts to people on disability benefit, which in itself doesn't just show that Boris's personality was cutting through in a different way, but him being in City Hall instead of being in Westminster, allows him that distance from the political decisions taken by the Tory government. He waves at the crowd, feels Cameron bristle next to him. Cameron might be PM, but Mayor Boris is far more popular. He's going to take full advantage of these games, bask in the glory of it all. It's time to step out from the shadow of the Prime Minister and prove to the nation that Boris Johnson is a force to be reckoned with on the world stage. October 2013, Beijing University, China. Boris sits at the front of the lecture hall. He's here to drum up Chinese investment in London. But George Osborne has brought his own trip to Beijing forward, and now he's on the stage talking about trade agreements. Boris sighs. His head throbs. He'd flown to China from his friend Egveni Lebedev's castle in Umbria. Lebedev controls the Evening Standard and the Independent, and he's given him a lot of support. He's exhausted, but he's determined to make an impression. He's going to outshine George Osborne on the international stage if it kills him. He listens now to Osborne telling the audience his daughter is studying Mandarin how he hopes for closer economic ties between China and the UK. Boris closes his eyes and listens to the polite applause ripple round the room. He jumps to his feet. His suit is crumpled from his weekend of partying. He's got a large stain on the front of his shirt. He opens his arms wide, announces that not only is his daughter studying Mandarin, she's coming to Beijing next week. How about that, George? He grins at Osborne over his shoulder, watches his face flush with irritation. He turns back to the audience. Who was Harry Potter's first girlfriend at Hogwarts? Who is the first person he kisses? That's right, Cho Chang, and she's Chinese. He grins at the laughter and applause. When he's finished, he nudges Osborne out of the way to shake hands with the officials. I think Mayor of London outranks Chancellor, don't you, George? He's in the lift when Osborne forces the door open and jumps in. His face is purple with fury. What the hell are you playing at, Boris? Trying to make me look like a bloody fool out there. The doors close. Osborne pushes his shoulder. He stumbles backward. He grabs Osborne by the lapels and shoves him back. The lift shudders. They're grappling when the lift doors open. Osborne's bodyguard stares at them both, open-mouthed. You all right, sir? Boris watches Osborne straighten his tie and march off. He smooths down his hair and allows himself a little smile of victory. David Cameron won't be Prime Minister forever, and Osborne's no match for him. All he has to do now is find a safe seat, get back into Parliament, rebuild his parliamentary career and destroy those smug, second-rate upstarts once and for all. It's summer 2014, a pub near Chequers. David Cameron watches the waiter wipe his hands on his crisp white apron, pick up another bottle of champagne and bring it to the table. He's having lunch with Boris, but they keep being interrupted by well-wishers sending bottles. Boris spins round, puts his thumbs up to the table behind them. Cameron tries to grin as he picks at his food. 
He's asked Boris to lunch to persuade him not to stand for Parliament until his time as mayor is over. But since Boris got here, half an hour late, they've been interrupted constantly. He can't understand why he's so popular. I find myself agreeing with Cameron. His garden bridge cost taxpayers £43 million before it got binned. The two second-hand water cannons he bought from Germany to use against rioters were faulty and had to be sold for scrap. And his £60 million cable car across the Thames is hardly used. When you hear them all listed like that and those outrageous sums, the projects that he's drawn to are purely vanity, aren't they? They're glory. Yes, and they're physical things. So Boris bikes happen even though they were Ken's idea. And it's almost like from that point on, he's like, I need a Boris bridge. I need a Boris something that leaves its physical mark on the landscape so he can never be forgotten. And so he can stamp his name on it. They'd even had a fight in his office about spending. Boris had tried to snatch a treasury briefing paper from his hand. They'd rolled around the floor until a special branch officer ran in and broke it up. Which is, I'm sure, what you spend years in training for. What an insane image. This is a recent Prime Minister rolling round on the floor with the Mayor of London. Was it in jelly? (laughs) Is that how you pictured it? (laughs) I might have used my own imagination there. I don't think you did mention that. It's not just that Boris is mobbed everywhere he goes. Cameron has pledged to hold a referendum on whether to stay in the EU if the Conservatives win the next election. He's on course for another term as PM. But if Boris returns to Parliament, he'll rally the Eurosceptics and use them as a power base. Cameron can live with Mayor Boris making life uncomfortable for him. But MP Boris could make it almost impossible. He has to keep him out of Parliament until the referendum's over. He leans forward now. I need a guarantee, Boris. Promise me you won't stand for Parliament until your time as Mayor is up. By all means, stand after that. We could even discuss a cabinet post. What do you say? Smart enough to make the prediction of how he's going to act, but not smart enough to assume that he's going to tell him the truth. He watches Boris take a mouthful of roast chicken. He doesn't say anything for a while. Then he nods. Well, I've got my hands full anyway. It isn't easy being mayor, you know. Cameron pours him a glass of champagne just in time for another bottle to be delivered by another well-wisher. That night in Chequers, he kisses Samantha, hands her a glass of wine, puts his feet up and lets himself relax. He can concentrate on winning the general election now, without Boris Mania being a distraction, or without him making his life hard in the referendum. He's heading to Prime Minister's questions a few days later when George Osborne runs up. Boris is standing for Uxbridge and South Ryslip. The party workers just rang. He was there this morning. Cameron lets his head tip back. It's not that Boris has lied that shocked him. It's how easily he took him at his word. From now on, he'll have to smarten up, be as cunning as Boris. Because if he doesn't stay one step ahead, Boris will snatch his political future right out of his hands. Sixteenth of February, twenty sixteen, Boris Johnson's house, Islington. Boris sits huddled next to Michael Gove. He needs to decide whether he's going to back Cameron or support the Leave campaign. Right now, he doesn't know which way to go. He listens carefully as Gove goes over their options. If they go with Leave and they lose, they could destroy their careers and be seen as unfaithful to Cameron. The party members won't like that. But if they go with Remain, they'll cut themselves off from a large chunk of the party that's pro-Leave. I can't believe that this huge decision, which six years on, we're only really just starting to deal with the consequences of, this is going to stretch far into the future. This wasn't based on belief or ideology or even really research or facts or data It's a pros and cons list in Boris's house with Michael Gove. Yes, and what's really driving Boris's motivation isn't what's best for the country. It's purely about what will deliver him into number 10 Downing Street. Boris glances over his shoulder. He can't concentrate. His stomach's rumbling, and Marina's just brought a slow-roasted shoulder of lamb from the oven. He watches her dish it up. A few minutes later, he sits down with Gove, his wife Sarah Vine, and his friend Evgeny Lebedev. 
He knows Lebedev's presence here tonight could cause a stir. Not least because his father is an oligarch and an ex-KGB agent. Lebedev had promised to bring Liz Hurley. Oh my God, sorry. Sorry, I was not expecting that. Unfortunately, she changed her mind at the last minute. Yeah, to be fair to Liz, I can see why. She's getting the least out of that situation. (laughs) He spends the rest of the evening smoking cigars with Gove and Lebedev, trying to figure out which way to go. Next morning, he wakes up with a stinking hangover, pulls on his tube driver's beanie, shoves his rucksack over his shoulder and cycles to Downing Street. He flops down into a chair opposite Cameron. (sighs) I've thought about it long and hard, but I'm no further forward. I'm organising a cabinet reshuffle soon. Why don't you think about the position you'd like? Anything except Chancellor. I can't afford to lose George. Boris jumps up, irritated. Cameron's always putting Osborne ahead of him. He heads to the door, but Cameron stops him leaving. I need you on board, Boris. He grins. I know you do. Cameron's cheeks flush with anger. I'm not your rival, I'm your Prime Minister. The least you can do is back me up. Boris feels his own face flush with anger. He should be the one calling the shots, not Cameron Minor. He takes a step towards him, but a special branch officer wedges himself between them. He glares at Cameron for a few seconds, then storms out. He has to get this decision right. If he does, it could make him more powerful than he's ever been. But if he gets it wrong, he'll be finished. Sunday the 21st of February 2016, Islington. Boris waits patiently as Marina straightens his blue tie. He's wearing a crisp dark suit and white shirt. He flattens down his neat haircut. The press have been outside his house for hours now. He needs to look like a serious politician. (laughs) That's a big ask. He kisses her forehead. Am I doing the right thing? She nods. I honestly think so. He looks in the mirror at his haggard face. He's seconds away from announcing his decision. The trouble is, he's still torn. A few days ago, he wrote two articles. One, arguing that leaving the EU would free Britain to control its own laws and immigration levels. The other, for Remain, argued it would be dangerous to leave such a massive market without any real alternatives. How it might push Scotland to break up the Union. How a weakened Europe might encourage Putin's aggression. He looks again in the mirror. He's at the height of his popularity. Choosing a side is a risk, but it's one he has to take. He tugs down his dark suit jacket, opens the door, steps out into the cold air and faces the surge of reporters. The last thing I wanted was to go against David Cameron or the government. But after a great deal of heartache, I don't think there's anything else I can do. I will be advocating vote leave. The reporters yell out questions as cameras flash and pop. Is this a calculated play for the leadership of the Conservative Party, Mr Johnson? Boris stares at his shoes, shakes his head. This is about Europe and how to take back control. Is this the first time we hear him say that? I think it is. Because that would become, in the drinking game of Boris Johnson life, that's the one that's getting you tipsy, isn't it? (laughs) A few minutes later, he heads back inside. Marina runs up. How was it? He hugs her. It was an imperial goat fuck. But now it's over. A what, sorry? An imperial goat fuck. Oh, an imperial goat fuck. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's what you call me on that WhatsApp group. (laughs) How have you seen that? He takes off his jacket, grabs a glass of wine and lets out a long sigh. Deciding is one thing. Making it work is another. Now he'll have to do everything he can to make sure his gamble pays off. This is the second episode in our series, 
Boris Johnson. A quick note about our dialogue. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, but all of our dramatizations are based on historical research. If you'd like to know more about this story, you can read Just Boris, A Tale of Blonde Ambition by Sonia Purnell, Chums by Simon Cooper, Blonde Ambition, The Rise and Rise of Boris Johnson by Nigel Cawthorn, The Gambler by Tom Bauer, and Boris Johnson by Andrew Jimson. I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Matt Ford. Karen Laws wrote this episode. Additional writing by Alice Levine and Matt Ford. Sound design by Rich Evans. Script editing by James Magniak. Script consulting by Max Stern. British Scandal is produced by Samizdat Audio. Our associate producer is Francesca Gilardi Quadrio Corsio. Our producer is Millie Chu. The senior producer is Joe Sykes. Our managing producers are Tonja Thigpin and Matt Gant. Our executive producers are Jenny Lower Beckman, Stephanie Jens, and Marshall Louie for Wondering.